Oh, good. Okay. It's working. Hi, everybody. Um, we're just getting set up here. We're going to start in about five minutes. Darlene Hines. Hello, Darlene. I saw you just like an hour ago, but I didn't get a chance to chat with you. I hope we can uh, hope we can do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute you, Darlene, just so we could say hi. When you get a chance, you can unmute yourself if you want to say hello too. And we're gonna get this thing set hi, up here. Hi, Hey, Darlene, how's it going? Oh, good. How are you? <laughs> good. I we, I didn't get into your little chat room, so I didn't get a chance to you, chat you with want, you. Right, right. Well, I was, some other I was time. Off, sure. We didn't get grouped together. Now you're this. Uh, Dr. Ottens is uh, is your neighbor. You guys are in the same state. Oh, we are in Michigan. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were in Illinois. My bad. All right, you're close. No. <laughs> <laughs> we're hey, close. They're in the same country. <laughs> um, That's for um, sure. And I see Nancy's with us here, and Ross, and Sandra, and William, Bill's here. So we're good. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a good crowd tonight and it's going to be great so we haven't started yet i'm just gonna we're getting our act together here which may never okay. actually happen but we'll do our best here so i'm gonna see what screen people see and make sure that works out i'm gonna step away here and just take a look at my screen here i'm gonna share my screen with here we go share screen Da -da 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 -da. I don't want that screen. We want to show the other screen. We want to show that screen. That's the screen we want to show. Darlene, you see the uh, the manuscript society presents with the uh, with the picture of John Rawlings down in the lower yes. left. Yes. Good. Okay. I'm just gonna go check my other computer, make sure. Thanks a lot for being our tech support. Hang on. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, we're looking good here. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got here. Good. Now, Al, I won't see me or you when I have the slides up. So that'll uh, that'll change when we go to eight o'clock. But you'll be able to be seen, and I'll be able to be seen. I just won't see you. So. Uh, so if you need to step or anything like that, just let me know, because that'll their screen will be all filled up. I think that's how we're going to do that. That's good. And people are rolling in from all over the country. That's good. Attendees, ten. Darlene, I'm going to mute you if you don't mind. Yes, please. Not that, Thank not, you. not that you did anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Darlene's muted. And people are rolling in, which is just great. We're going to be starting up in about two minutes. If uh, there's an old line that says if you're uh, if you're not early, you're late. We're going to start at 8 o'clock and get our hour and a little bit in. We have a great chat with Dr. Ottens, and we'll have some time for questions and, uh, and maybe a little conversation and whatever. Tonight, um, um, the uh, public TV starts the Ken Burns Ben Franklin series, which should be very interesting, and, uh, with Man Mandy Potemkin as the uh, playing uh, playing uh, uh, Ben Franklin. You know. Hey Al, did you ever notice? Did you watch the series, the Ken Burns series on the Civil War? Oh gosh, yes, that was what it came out uh, 30 years ago, right? 30. Yeah, yeah, a long. I guess it was that long ago. I don't know it was that long ago, but boy, it was just yeah. incredible. Somebody mentioned to me that every time the uh, they talked about the, the Union Army. They had fiddle music in the background, and every time they talked about the Confederate Army, they had banjo music in the background. So, so I won't be playing my banjo tonight. So I'm just going to leave it sit here in my office till we get started. <laughs> okay, that looks great. That looks great. <clears throat> I'm going to set this up. There we go. Uh, I set up a uh, another computer in my office and I signed Nancy in so I can make sure I can see what 
what the audience sees because sometimes it always doesn't work out quite that right. And I have eight o'clock. So I'm gonna welcome everybody to Manuscript Monday, a, uh, a program and a member benefit and a benefit to the, to the world uh, of the Manuscript Society, which is a not-for-profit organization uh, whose mission is to preserve, protect, and educate folks about manuscripts and historical documents. Tonight, we have a really special guest uh, and our special guest is Dr. Alan Ottens. He is the author of General John A. Rowland's No Ordinary Man, and the program tonight is the behind the scenes look at writing General John A. Rowling's No Ordinary Man. Uh, I'm your host, Brian Cathanis. I'm a member, a trustee, a member of the Manuscript Society, a trustee, and a member of the Executive Committee. So with that, let's get started. No sense hanging around and talking about all kinds of crazy things like that. So who is our sponsor tonight? As I mentioned, the sponsor is the Manuscript Society. Uh, why a webinar? It's the best way and the easiest way to reach the most amount of people with the least amount of cost or expense or investment on the part of the participant and of the provider. Why now? Well, uh, Dr. Otten's book has been out a little while. It's a great topic. It's always a great topic. And what better time than the present to make sure that we can share as much information as we can. We've invited just about anybody. Uh, it is open to the public. There are no restrictions on who can watch and who can attend and who can ask questions. Um, we've, I know we've invited members of my organization from the Society of American Archivists. We've invited members of the Manuscript Society. I see some friends and uh, colleagues from the International Society Society of Appraisers, and uh, some people have just in, invited their friends. So I'm going to tell you what we're going to cover in just a second. I'm also going to tell you how you can get more information about our topic tonight and about the Manuscript Society. So <clears throat> with that, let me let you know if you're new to our webinars, you're on the go to webinar format, which is something that we use at the Manuscript Society. It seems to work pretty well for us. Um, and you'll find that there is a place to raise your hand if you want. There's a little hand that goes up and down if you want to do that. There's a spot for you to type in questions and you can chat. You can either leave a chat message to me or you can leave a chat message to the entire audience if you wanted to do that. Um, and I'll make sure that we have time at the end for questions. Um, uh, Al Throttons is going to be able to answer any questions or we'll have the opportunity to, to chat with you about questions. I can either read them off to him or I can unmute you and you can certainly welcome. Your, your, uh, uh, your video is not on, so if you're in your jammies, that's perfectly fine. Um, um, and if you're not, that's got all dressed up for the evening. <laughs> that's entirely up to you, but we won't know that. So with that in mind, I'd like to um, tell you a little more about um, about uh, what we talked a little bit about, what we're going to cover. We talked about that. We're going to talk about why Rollins. Uh, why did why did Dr. Ottens pick this particular person? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the book writing process, uh, finding a publisher, and these are going to be based on on Al's experience as a writer. And he's written more than just one book. He is a he is a uh, certainly a scholar in many areas. We're going to talk about collaborating with editors, some tips for new authors some traps to avoid, things that you might run into or he may have run into. And then we're gonna have a quick discussion, a short discussion on self-publishing versus what's referred to as legitimate publishers. Um, I share a lot of experience in self-publishing. I've published several books uh, through our own publishing company, uh, Hope uh, Beyond Hope Publishing. And, and Al will talk about his work with uh, Indiana University Press and some of the other organizations he's worked with and other publishing companies. That's kind of what we're gonna talk about. But most important, I wanna talk about Dr. Ottens. And Al Ottens is a professor emeritus of counselor education and supervision at Northern Illinois University. Um, he has also been involved in many other university and work on campus and around campus. He's the past president of the Manuscript Society. He's also an active trustee, a member of the executive committee, and he's very involved. He's helped set up so many conferences and we're just really delighted to have him with us tonight as our guest. Dr. Ottens is a lifelong learner of the history of the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln and I can very easily say that he has forgotten more about this part of American history than I will ever know um, and it's just an honor to have him here too um, and with that I'd like to present Dr. Ottens. He's the good looking guy. I'm the guy that's just got the headphones on and we're going to dive right into it. Okay let me 
Well, Brian, did you want to start with a question or do you want yeah. me to launch I, I, in? I sure do. Let me just, well, just want to talk a little bit about the book that John okay. A. Rawlins, The Ordinary Man, by you. It's the first major biography of Rawlins in over a century, traces his rise to assistant editor general and ultimately grants secretary awards, published by Indiana Press, uh, which came out in August of 2021. So now that you know a little more about the book, let's find out a little more about what's going on. So Al, uh, let's just start with why Rawlins? I put some questions up here that that you can see, and I got some questions along the way. So, how, why did you decide on with all the the Civil War figures, both Confederate and Union? Did you decide that that uh, Rawlins was the guy you wanted to wanted to focus on? Well, thank you, Brian. And let me to, to answer that first question. Let me give a member of our manuscript society, the book reviewer of our flagship journal, Bill Butts, a lot of credit for this. Bill had his uh, Main Street Fine Books and Manuscript store on Main Street, of course, in Galena. Mm -hmm. and I used to go over there and uh, hang out at his store for an afternoon, and we just uh, chat. And one time, gosh, easily 20, 25 years ago, he said to me, why don't you write a new biography of John Rawlins? Rollins was one of the Galena generals along with the uh, Ulysses Grant. And uh, he brought that question up on many more than one occasions. And mm -hmm. I finally started to listen. And I said, you know, I think you're right. When I retire from academia, I think I might do it. Then I get retired and I see that there are, there's a spate of biographies that have come out on Grant. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many have appeared since about the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, it seemed like the timing was right. Uh, Bill Butts was right. And um, I sat down and got to it. It took me about five years from start to finish to, uh, to write all of the 588 pages or whatever that are in the book. Wow. Neat. So, uh, it, any discoveries, things that, that you had no idea that surprised you once you started your research? Well, one of the things that surprised me was, um, and, and it, it really wasn't a big surprise, I knew about it uh, going in, but one of the th challenges I faced uh, was how to write this book in the absence of John Rawlins's papers, he apparently had two trunkfuls, trunks full, I guess is the right word, mm -hmm. of papers that he had saved from his time on Grant's staff. And no one really knows what happened to those, whether they were destroyed. Some thought that maybe Bruce Catton got a hold of them. Mm -hmm. And or Bruce Catton, the, known for series. many of his Civil War books, wrote, wrote many series, incredible number of, uh, of books yes. related to the Civil War. Sure. Yep. Um, the Library of Congress, back in the 1930s and 1960s, set about trying to find those papers. And um, they made two very, very thorough investigations and came up empty handed. So that was one surprise. What am I going to have to do to make up for the papers? Uh, and uh, one of the, luckily, one of the uh, saving graces that I uh, came across was the fact that the Galena Public Library has copies, the original copies of the newspapers of the day, mm -hmm. going back into the you know 1840s. Wow. So, no uh, the newspapers were a great, great discovery and find uh, and helped me really put a lot together that other researchers had never, uh, they had never scratched the surface of those newspapers. So that was, was, it, was, that, was that because of the focus? It was a Galena focused newspaper and you got to really learn yes, about the they, There were several newspapers that came out in Galena during the, you know, 1850s and 1860s. Sure. And I these see. are on the shelves in the Galena Public Library. Just a, a wonderful resource. So and do I we learn? Thank, 
Go ahead. I'm I sorry. want to thank the uh, library staff and the people that uh, staff the uh, reading room there to who helped me out tremendously. So I guess we get to learn a lot about Kalina in your book as well. And another surprise, amazingly, as I began writing and continued to write, the town itself became seemed to become a uh, character of the book, mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that uh, it has a, a rich historical uh, legacy uh, that uh, for a small town, it produced a great number of politicians, jurists, mm -hmm. people of renown, businessmen, military leaders. Uh, so the town itself became a character in its own right, a colorful character, if I might say so. I see. I see. I see. Um, anything you, the other things you discovered? When I think of Rollins, I think about this guy that followed Grant around and kept taking whiskey bottles out of his back pocket or out of his hand or running through camp and making sure there was no alcohol around. Right. And, and I don't, I think that's probably a, a, a major misconception, but that's kind of the, when you read a short bio, you read a little bit about their interaction. Tell me to either dispel that or, or expand on that and tell me about what else Rawlins did be, whether he did that at all. Wow. Uh, that's a big question and a great question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me try to tackle that. I don't know if I can get through it. I mean, we could spend literally the rest of the evening talking I'm, about I'm sorry. Or everybody could buy a copy of your book. <laughs> <laughs> and you're very right. I mean, if anybody knows Rollins at all these days, it's as this, uh, this nag, if you will, or scold who, mm. tried, to kept, who tried to keep Grant sober. Uh, a point I make in the book, and I think I have some interesting uh, information to back it up, but the point I make in the book is that Grant had more control over his drinking than most people would give him credit for. I see. And uh, and in fact, his uh, the commanders under his, uh, the, the generals under his command were never really too much bothered by his occasional drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones who made a big issue of it were the folks, the generals and politicians who were trying to, uh, who were jealous of Grant and tried to undermine his uh, success. Those I are the see. ones who would make the biggest uh, stink about Grant and were the ones who generated all these rumors about uh, him going on benders. Sure. And when you look at his letters, and I've had opportunities to probably see more letters from Grant than most people on the planet through our, our appraisal work. Right. He was incredibly sharp. He was managing campaigns hundreds and hundreds of miles away from where he was. He knew exactly what was going on. There was never in, in my reading any indication that he wasn't on top of it and sharp as attack on every every order he gave. Right. Very much so. Uh, Rollins, of course, was a sworn enemy of drink. His mm -hmm. mother was uh, involved in the temperance movement. And in fact, temperance meetings were held at their home outside of Galena. Um, Rollins also very much respected Grant and realized that in Grant, the nation had somebody who could be a military success, Mm -hmm. and could save the union, all right? So Rollins was very much concerned that uh, anything might happen to, uh, to weaken Grant, uh, to undermine uh, his uh, capability, and also to try and, and stamp out any rumors about Grant's drinking. I got it. Now, I see. a couple other things. One of the items of my research that I'm pretty convinced of is that Rollins used, <clears throat> relied on, if you will, a book of sermons written by the Reverend Lyman Beecher back in the early 1830s. It's called Six Sermons on, in, on Intemperance. And it's very clear to me that Rollins must have been familiar with this book and used some of Beecher's teachings, especially on assessing alcohol problems mm -hmm. and intervening. 
um, these were the topics of two of those sermons. So it appears to me that Rollins tried to intervene with Grant using Lyman Beecher's uh, topics from his sermons. Oh, I see. Okay. Plagiarism at its best. Huh? <laughs> well, why not? Also, yeah. <clears throat> also, it's not so much how much Rollins stopped Grant from drinking and going down the path to perdition, mm -hmm. but everyone in Washington knew Rollins was a sworn enemy of drink and would do whatever it took to uh, police the camp and make sure that the camp was as dry as the Sahara. I see. So Raw Rollins' pl uh, presence really was um, really uh, um, allowed for the peace of mind of people like Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and President Lincoln, right. mm -hmm. who knew that Rollins was there. I and, see. Uh, and the more responsibility that Grant got, the more uh, people like Lincoln and Stanton uh, were put to uh, were allowed to rest easy, knowing that Rollins, you know, was on the prowl. I got it. Good deal. Well, we're going to talk more about Rollins, but let's talk a little bit about the book writing process. You said this this came into your head many many years ago. When did you first start put pen to paper, as they say, or fingers to the keyboard and and get things started or, or how much research did you do before you even put a page on the uh, a word on the page yeah good question i had probably about seven or eight chapters written uh and had probably been writing for at least a year and a half before i try even tried to find a publisher i wow. knew and from the outset that i didn't want to self-publish i mm -hmm. realized i was not a name author so uh, a literary agent was not going to, you know, wouldn't want to touch me. Sure. So I see. my my thought was to go the route of a university press. Mm -hmm. And I had, as I say, seven or eight chapters in hand, and I took them to a university press that I was convinced would be more than happy, delighted <laughs> to publish this book. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, they gave me what can only be called, using an old slang phrase, the bum's rush. <laughs> Don't let the door hit you on the way out, huh? <laughs> they didn't want to see it. They didn't want to talk to me. They didn't no, want to look at it. Wow. So uh, a little time passed, and I took it to another university press. And one of their editors Got, I, I gave one of their editors two or three chapters, and this person loved them and oh, said, wow. we really we really need to publish this. Mm -hmm. And I was on cloud nine. However, as the, as the decision went up the chain of command, the managing editor finally put the kibosh on it <laughs> and said, no, no. no. <laughs> All right. Uh... So that's strike two. Then I happened to talk to our own Brad Cook, who's the who is the editor of our journal, the manuscripts is, right. is what it's called. Yep. Brad was writing a book for Indiana University Press. In fact, he works there in the library, mm -hmm. and his office happens to be in the same building that houses the Indiana University Press. And I asked Brad if he would be so kind as to give me the name of the editor that he worked with. Well, that led from one, one thing to another. I sent them a few sample chapters. They loved it. They were delighted with it. And uh, one thing led to another, and we signed the contract. Oh, that's great. So, so I, I, owe, I owe Brad a big pat on the back for a lot of this, you know. He's a great guy and certainly dedicated to the Manuscript Society and and certainly a, an incredible archivist in his in his own right, uh, taking care of all of the all of the records in the archives right there at the at the university. He even found my dissertation from like a gazillion years ago about a syllabus I wrote for manuscript manuscript appraising. So he knows his stuff. So you got the you got the deal now, but the book's not done, right? You got a couple, you got said seven or eight chapters. What happens yeah, after that have, once you once you've three more years of writing to do? Absolutely. Three years. So 
let me ask you about the three years. So when you start, a lot of changes in three years. Uh, you know, you uh, maybe our styles of writing change, maybe our vocabulary changes, maybe the information that we've re-researched. How do you maintain the same, I was gonna say the voice, the same voice at the beginning of chapter one or wherever you started your chapter and the end so it so it continues to sound like you or the narrator or the or the author of the book yes well one of the things i had to do was constantly reread what i'd written mm -hmm. to make sure that there was continuity it flowed well uh i also wanted to make sure that um that uh, I connected information from from previous chapters to what I was writing in the present so that mm -hmm. the reader wouldn't be confused or so I had to make sure that uh, they would able to they were able to connect what I talked about earlier. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that I didn't rush my writing. Mm -hmm. uh, the closer I think you get to the end, the more you want to finish and hence your writing style might become a little haphazard rushed hurried if you will i i wanted everything to stay smooth and uh and uh, retain that voice that i started with got it I, so tip, I also tips. Ahead, if please. anybody knows me i have a little bit of sense of humor <laughs> a <And> little <laughs> yeah you're the life of the party. I'm glad I see you don't have a lampshade on your head tonight. <laughs> uh, my wife took it off. <laughs> so you'll see a few lighthearted uh, things to, you know, break up the monotony. I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and to my credit, the uh, IUP folks kept it in. Yeah. Now, good. While we're on this topic, let me say one thing, and I should give this person credit where credit is due. Somehow I became um, introduced to a retired professor of library science at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota, a woman by the name of Marie Kelsey, who was a grant scholar. Oh, okay. And she read every chapter of the book wow gave me feedback gave me suggestions gave me encouragement and i owe her a debt of gratitude because she was also one who could keep uh my writing style within proper bounds so was she your official editor or was she kind of a no a, she was not an editor coach. she was simply an unpaid an unpaid friendly person who really put a lot of hours into this to me who believed also in the project i see oh that's she didn't great think it was worthwhile she would have dropped it like a hot potato i'm sure I'll bet. so did you have an editor at uh indiana university press that you worked with yes or... i had i had an editor on their staff uh anna francis is the one who saw it through to publication and is that a challenge? How does uh, how do how does one work with an editor? You you certainly have in your mind since you had chapters down already how you wanted the book to sound, what you wanted in it. Um, what was the editor's role in, in that process? Very very light handed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's heavy handed and there's light handed. The the editor editorial process they allowed almost everything to go through they didn't want they mm -hmm. hardly touched a word however wow. they did want me to cut back on some of the length because the book was becoming uh you know it was growing like topsy mm -hmm. and if I you see. had the book in your hand you realize you you may want to be wearing steel-toed <laughs> shoes so if you drop it you know you don't you don't break your toe I remember seeing on the first page that OSHA warning about the about the danger. Yes, there, yeah, <laughs> carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> there you go. Um, three years in the process, and you said 20 years before that. Just thinking about it. Any tips for a new author, someone that might have an interest in trying to uh, to get a book going? Oh boy. Uh, yeah. Make sure that if you're married 
you you work this out out with your spouse. That's and because you know that's really I spent solid. a lot of time up at the computer. Pardon? I said I said that's that sounds like great advice from all all angles of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Make sure that you you know that uh, your spouse knows what they're in for. Uh, secondly, you're probably uh, my advice to a, a budding author would be to realize that you're probably going to be doing more research for your book than you thought. Okay. Uh, ideas and situations and facts don't necessarily spring from one's fertile mind only so and how about you, uh, a fiction even a fiction like a historical fiction would oh a historical well? fiction, you you need to do your work to find out what the clothing was like the manners were like uh so many things so you're doing a heck of a lot of research um right from the get-go got it got it good deal so in your research um some unusual facts or things that surprised you or connections with Rawlins and the rest of the world that that you went holy mackerels check that yeah. out that you like to share a couple of those I, I'll, i'm going to share a couple of things yes thank you that's a great question um one of the things i found out uh, and didn't expect this to be the case there is uh in F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, Tender is the Night, and I'm going to read it because there is a, a line in which, uh, in which Fitzgerald talks about Grant lolling in his general store in Galena. And huh. it's like, hey, what is that doing in an F. Scott Fitzgerald novel? <laughs> All right. Grant, Grant and Galena, what the heck does that mean? Well, through my research, I discovered that F. Scott Fitzgerald's grandfather, believe it or not, was part of a late afternoon bull session. A group of four people from Galena <laughs> would get together late afternoon in John Rollins's law office and just have a bull session based talking about all of the uh current events that were going on in the world at that time wow so philip, philip mcquillan who was a young man who was one of the quartet in rollins's office turned out to be f scott fitzgerald's grandfather that, that's and incredible from, i'm sure wow wow yeah. Jeez. you mentioned also um about well about rollins passing it and Roland's health. I want to share a little bit about that because I don't know if a lot of people know about that. Yeah, uh, John Rollins died at a very early age. He was like 38. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had contracted tuberculosis from his first wife who died in August 1861. Wow. Rollins didn't start showing uh, symptoms until like about the end of 1863 it took a while for the disease to uh percolate within his system and of course it wound up killing him and mm -hmm. it was of course and it was one of the public health scourges at the time obviously sure. mm -hmm. and uh so one of the topics that i didn't quite expect to have to research as i did was the treatment of tuberculosis in the mid 19th century. And I'm gonna mention this and you cannot believe how much time I devoted to finding out, discovering what an issue P is. An All right? issue P. Yes, Rollins had a uh, uh, surgery done where a surgeon inserted what's called an issue P, huh. like issue as in magazine issue, P as in eat your peas and carrots, yeah. an issue P under his skin. I'd never heard of that before. No, some subcutaneous implant, huh? Oh, God. Wow. And finally, a researcher, a professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, 
a professor of the history of medicine set me straight on that. Wow, isn't that incredible? Now, I'm not going to tell the audience tonight <laughs> what an issue he is. Oh, we got to buy the book. We're back to you gotta you buy, gotta the, buy book. the book. <laughs> that's great. Well, that's fascinating. Great. Um, <clears throat> I'm just looking at some of the things that we put down here and, and things that I put down there. The release of the book, was there pressure to get done by a certain day? Did you have a deadline that kind of made you push a little harder? Yeah, they wanted it done by August 3rd, or the publication date was August 3rd. So they wanted uh, enough lead time to get it out, to have uh, publicity out. Uh, so um, luckily, uh, I didn't drag my feet. I got it done on time. Um, and um, and the, And the deadline was met. Was that a hard deadline for promotion or tying it in with other things that were going to be published? It or worked out. It worked out very well for me. I did not feel hurried. Um, I was one of these people who wrote a little bit every day. Mm -hmm. Had to. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, you mentioned uh, Shelby Foote's big. We talked about his three yes. volume history, of the Civil yes. War, and you he got some advice from him or, or read something about how many words. Was it a good right. day of writing? I read an interview that Shelby Foote gave about the time of that um, PBS showing of the Civil War. Remember, mm -hmm. Shelby Foote was uh, was one of the interviews the interviewees. Right. And um, he said in this interview that what he sh would shoot for as a writer. And let me step back because you know some of us in the audience here are aware of his three volume history of the Civil War, mm -hmm. which totaled around 2,800 pages. All right, it was a massive undertaking. Huge, yeah. And Shelby Foote in this interview said that he thought he had a good day when he finished the day with 250 usable words <laughs> no kidding that's incredible yes. <laughs> and by god i found that to be the case mm -hmm. if i had two paragraphs that i could finish and i felt good about and i thought you know could stand as finished product i thought i put in a good day isn't that wild that's great that's so cool um Traps to avoid. We talked about some tips. Are there things that oh, I just got to mark? Mark Grossman just said, just goes to show you the power of networking. I think it was referring to the F. Scott Fitzgerald connection. <laughs> Let me know if I got that right, Mark, or I didn't get that right. Cool. That's pretty cool. I like that. Good. Um, tips for uh, traps to avoid, things that uh, people might run into that could cause trouble, whether it be you mentioned a little bit about haste and about kind of losing your voice during the book and uh, knowing it's going to take a lot longer than you thought. Anything else that you'd uh, share with authors or soon-to-be authors? Oh, wow. Um, I think one of the main things to do, and I don't know if this is a trap to avoid or a tip to take to heart, okay. is find a friend or colleague or family member who can assist in the reading and helping keep you on track, all right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot in writing, a lot of ups and downs okay. where you think one day you are, you know, it couldn't get better. This is this is easy this is like a roller coaster ride uh like the fun of a roller coaster but there can be difficult days where the writing isn't coming along so it really helps to have somebody who uh, provides support encouragement tips suggestions uh as i said um uh, Professor Kelsey up in Duluth was a person who um, who fulfilled that 
uh, role for me, as as did my wife. She read every every word, mm -hmm. and even shed a tear when Rollins died. So, oh, wow. uh, mm -hmm. so a trap to avoid is um, thinking that this is gonna this is gonna come through as uh, smooth as silk. It really doesn't. There are ups and downs. Understood. Um, you went through several university presses to be able to figure out where this, how long do you, th now that you look back, I guess it's easier to look back and hindsight's always 2020. would you have kept going? Or at what point do you think you would have said, nobody wants this, I'm not gonna bother, I'm just gonna put it away and let family worry about it somewhere down the line? Uh, I never did that. I always thought somebody would buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I had, I always had luck with other books that I wrote um, during my time in academia. I always found we, a publisher. Understand. Can we touch on those just very briefly? I know we're talking about Rollins tonight and that, but people need to know a little bit about your background, that this isn't your first book, and uh, and it was from a, a totally different totally different perspective. Yeah. Um, um, I uh, Not to go into great detail, but... Uh, edited a book on sexual assault on the college campuses, uh, mm -hmm. which was published by uh, Sp Springer Verlag. Uh, a friend of mine was a uh, an editor at Springer. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I guess I'm a, I'm a believer in if there's a will, there's a way. You know, mm -hmm. somebody uh, somebody's going to somebody's going to like it there I mean, you go mm -hmm. remember remember our old friend dr seuss i do I remember think. dr seuss theodore geisel yes theodore geisel had that yeah. book if i ran the zoo and i think mm -hmm. he took it to 38 publishers before he found somebody that would look at these crazy drawings and realize <laughs> there was some method to this madness Yep, for sure. And, and you think uh, about a guy like Stephen King, who went around and around until Bill Thompson, our friend, good friend, Bill Thompson, found him, um, said, kid, I think we could do something with your book. But it's the idea of, of just staying at it. So and people will find value. It's a matter of finding, I guess, finding the right, uh, right audience, for sure. I'll tell you another Real. thing, too. Um, um, you'll see that the foreword of the book was written by uh, a good friend of mine, just a delightful fellow, and he wrote it along with two of his colleagues. Uh, John Marzalek uh, was the uh, uh, author or, or the writer of the foreword. John is the executive director of the U.S. Grant Presidential Library down right. at Mississippi State University. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a wonderful first first class outfit down there of researchers and archivists and uh, John also very much believed in the book and I owe him a ton of credit for volunteering to write the foreword I mean you can't oh, you can't find a, a a greater grant scholar these days than Professor Marzalek that's wonderful. Good deal. Actually Mark Grossman says he, he was talking about the uh, the power of networking and Brad Cook at the Manuscript Society. He said, shows the power of networking and joining the Manuscript Society. Mark's, Mark is pushing, got a big plug there for the Manuscript Society as well. So you had your book was picked up by a publisher, Indiana University Press. What did you have to do? Because we're going to get into the difference between self-publishing and working with a legitimate publishing house like Indiana University Press and the other publishers bring you've worked with. Um, what did you have to do along the way? Uh, were you involved in the marketing? Were you involved in the design? Was it just you submit the manuscript and then they just kept you in a loop along the way? Another great set of questions. Um, Indiana University Press will send out a whole mess of of uh, tips. Um, and uh, uh, guidelines to follow mm -hmm. uh, as you're writing and prep prepping for submission, the final piece, all right? Got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
so I'm not going to go into detail. I mean, it's, these are it, sure. it's, it's a it's a large packet of information and guidelines that they send you. Now, unfortunately, sometimes I don't follow directions as well as. <laughs> I <laughs> You're a rebel, my friend. <laughs> uh, well, no, I'm too old for that. But they wanted, they want, uh, for example, the author of a manuscript to follow the Chicago style of references. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I grew up cutting my teeth on what's called the APA style of right. references. Yeah. Yep. And it took me a lifetime to learn that. <laughs> I mean, if you pick up the APA style manual, the damn thing's 600 pages. <laughs> All right? Yeah. <laughs> and so is the Chicago style manual. I just didn't yeah. have time yep. to be able mm -hmm. to um, learn a whole new system of referencing. And so I sent it in the way I wanted. Good for you, because if you go to any university press's submission page, um, there's yeah. all this stuff you fill out beforehand, and I imagine you were far <laughs> along on the process, and yes. you know, why turn yes. back and start all over? <laughs> you were, you were almost halfway there. The submission process, they also ask you for magazines, journals, organizations that would be interested in receiving, you know, like a... Uh, um, a desk copy of the volume, uh, or who would be interested in writing a review. So I filled all that out, and uh, mm -hmm. Got but it. that's all fair game. That's you. You'd sure. have to expect that to be part of the process. Okay, but you didn't have to go out and find a publisher. You didn't have to find a printer. You didn't have to design the cover. You didn't have to do your own marketing. You didn't have to uh, set up interviews with all of the radio stations that you and send a sample copy out to them so they can interview you about the book to to keep the sales I have, going. I have done some some on my own of scheduling mm -hmm. book signings. Sure. But I'll yep. tell you another quick story, and I don't know how we're fixed on time. We're in pretty good well, shape. All right. Speaking of another thing, and, and this was, uh, again, learning by doing, uh, they, the uh, IUP press people wanted me to submit a uh, uh, design for the cover, a, a, a photo that could be used, a, a picture. Uh, so I was going to... Um, well, let me, let me back up a second. So I had to find a picture of Rollins. Mm -hmm. And the picture that I really liked was a an oil portrait of him that was done after his death by a German painter, portrait mm -hmm. painter. Very wonderful portrait. And the copy of it, the original, hangs in the Pentagon. All right? So I had to get permission from the Pentagon to use that oil painting oh, no for the wow. cover. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, it's not easy to get <laughs> the Pentagon to respond to a <laughs> simple request. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's too funny. The Pentagon. I mean, it's a building that's, you know, 6,000 acres in size. Yeah, yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working with the person there who's the Pentagon curator of art. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and she was really doing a fine job. And she said, we're going to send you a copy of this, a photo, a photo of it that you can use as the copy for the cover. Oh, nice. Okay. All right. Yep. Well, this, this, and she said, we're going to email it to you. And I waited and waited, and the email never came through. Oh, no. <laughs> Here's the problem. The yeah. Pentagon has its own email system. Oh, so with a high level of security. My computer, my computer read it as spam and spit it out. <laughs> spam from the Pentagon. <laughs> spam from the Pentagon. We don't read that kind of stuff. That's right. There's a lot of spam comes out of the Pentagon, I think. You know. <laughs> oh, that's wild. But you managed to find it all worked out, huh? Yeah, but then then I finally got the copy, and the f people at Indiana University Press 
strongly advised me not to use it because they thought it was too dark and wouldn't show up well. Oh my goodness. Oh, gee whiz. So what'd you end up using? We'll show the cover in just a second. I'll bounce yeah. ahead to the, to the, to the, uh, to the a, book again. That was a photo they came up with. I got it. Good deal. It might be in the National Archives or something, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a handsome photo of the general. That's great. Good deal. So you didn't need an ISBN number. They had all that kind of stuff. This a legitimate, and this is referred to as legitimate publishing. There's self-publishing and anybody can self-publish a book in a variety of ways. We've chosen it at National Appraisal Consultants and on my own my own works. This, we started our own publishing company called Beyond Hope Publishing because no one would ever publish our books anyway. So, uh, And I live in Hope, New Jersey, and that's where that came from. But you can get your own ISBN numbers. You can find your own printers. We use actually Share In Printing, which is a book printing company out in the Midwest. We had someone design our cover. We had an editor and kind of a coach. I uh, actually had a ghostwriter in some ways in our trivia book to take our stories that we had on the radio and turn them into little narratives. But it's a huge amount of work. Amazon has a, uh, and I'm not suggesting Amazon over everybody else, they have a, a division called Create Space where they work out a deal with you, they publish it. There are vanity publishers that you can spend a lot of money with and they will publish your book, whatever it is. They don't really care whether it sells or not. They make their money on the deal and printing the books. Um, the first 3,000 copies that we self-published came, uh, came to my garage the day before Thanksgiving and the next day after that, we were uh, fired from the radio, the AM radio station we were on where we thought we'd be able to plug all those books and get rid of them. Uh, we gave out 500 of them the first time around to radio stations across the country and it did quite well, but it's a lot of work. So if you're thinking about self-publishing, you might want to check out a book by a guy named Dan Pointer, P-O-Y-N, T-E-R, and he wrote a book called The Self-Publishing Manual, and uh, and that's another that's another great book. And there's another one whose author escapes me, and I'll put it in our follow-up notes called 1001 Ways to Market Your Book. One of those ways was Amazon, um, Barnes & Noble didn't want our book, so we went into Barnes & Noble and left the book on the shelf. <clears throat> and eventually, somebody bought it, and when they brought it up to the counter, it wasn't in their system, so they called us and asked for a case of books and that's how we ended up in Barnes & Noble. So there's crazy ways in self-publishing to promote. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that. This is really about, about you, Al, and, and your book. But I wanted, people were asking, one of the questions was, what's the difference between a legitimate publisher and, and self-publishing? Um, after you do a couple of those self-publishing books, you get pretty good at it. But there is a level of, uh, uh, of credibility that comes from a legitimate publishing firm or publishing house or university press that you don't get with uh, self-publishing. Snooky from Jersey Shore published a book. So, you know, what does that say about people who self-publish? <laughs> you still doing good, Al? Yeah, fine. Good. All right, let's do. We do a few questions, or yeah, where let's are we along. at? I got to, we got to do a little. Uh, we got to plug the manuscript society here for just a bit, and then we'll get on to questions. Uh, Kim, I see you have your hand up. I won't forget you. I'll make sure I get to you. But uh, just to let you know what's going on with the manuscript society, the first Monday of the month we have manuscript Mondays there on the right hand side. Um, next month we'll be talking to Spencer Stewart, who we're talking about kind of the life cycle of collections acquisitions and deaccessioning and and what people collect and trends in the market which i think will be really really important and powerful especially today and may 10th to 14th the manuscript society has our annual meeting which is down in williamsburg virginia the coolest part about manuscript society conferences and conventions is you get to go through the door that says employees only, staff members only, museum specialists only. Um, and it's a really, really great thing. So if that's something you're interested in, that's coming up in May. I'll tell you how to get to that. But you also need to figure out where you're going to confine Al. And you might find Al on April 24th in Galena, Illinois. Son of a gun. You're doing a lecture there. Right. Um, I imagine it's going to be about John A. Rollins. <laughs> Yes, it is, and it's also being held on the 200th birthday of Ulysses Grant. And Galena, of course, is uh, one of Grant's towns. So we hope to have a, a very good turnout and, uh, and a lot of questions, and I hope we sell a lot of books. 
There you go. <laughs> hey, if you go to Galena, galenahistory.org, there's a lot going on there. I think there's there's some Civil War reenactment going on. There's a big encampment. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of youth groups are going to be setting up tents for the weekend. There's all kinds of lectures and music. It sounds like a good place to kind of visit if you want to get out there in April, spend the whole weekend out there, and then uh, wrap up your day with some time uh, listening to Al talk a little bit about Rollins. All right. Anything else about your Galena event? Well, one thing I should note. You see where it says Territory Drive? That's the area in which John Rawlins grew up. So when oh, you no read kidding. the book, you'll you'll hear things about Guilford uh, uh, Township out okay. in that county. And this is the area that Rawlins would have been uh, uh, would have been a part of while he was growing up. Oh, I got it. Oh, that's great. Very interesting. Good. Okay, some final thoughts here, just so you know what's going to happen. Um, there's a certificate of attendance that's coming your way within an hour of ending this webinar. So look for it. It could end up in your spam. It's an email. It's going to say, thanks for attending. And it'll say your certificate of participation or attendance is attached. Give it a long time to download. When you click on it, that little wheel is going to go around. Go for a cup of coffee, have a beer, come on back. It will download. If you have problems, um, reach out to me through um, through the Manuscript Society. I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a link um, if you need to. They do download. We've just having a little trouble with uh, with GoToWebinar. If they tell me it's it's at our end and it's really at their end, but it'll it'll get there. And if you don't get it, let me know. Uh, it's good for all it says is you've attended for an hour. You have to send it off to your appraisal organizations i see a lot of appraisers here tonight to your continuing ed organizations if you need hours for that but uh but that's for you too next 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 come on i got another button here to hit um you can watch this webinar anytime eventually we're going to be posting it to the manuscript society website and we're going to post it on a manuscript society youtube channel uh that'll be coming in just a little bit give us a week or maybe two weeks to get that up but we'll eventually get that up there and let's see if i can figure out where my next slide is and uh certainly thank you for attending and thanks to the trustees and staff of the manuscript society and for all of those folks who attended um don't go away because we're going to open it up to questions but if you have questions and you're not a manuscript society member you can go to manuscript.org even if you're not a member go there take a look you'll find interesting articles there'll be all kinds of connections and links to the past uh, manuscript mondays including um a uh, special on the declaration of independence uh, all the ones, there are many, many copies out there. Some are very valuable, some are not, and different versions you probably never heard of. There is a, a, a webinar up there about phonies, fakes, and forgeries of manuscripts, documents, autographs, and signatures. And uh, there's one on what appraisers do and how appraisers determine value. That stuff will all be up there in just a little bit. So with that, we have some time to open it up for questions. So let me see. I'm going to just look over here and see what's what I see. Kim, you had your hand up. Can I? I'm going to unmute you. Would you like to ask Al a question? And if your hand wasn't supposed to be up, then you could just put your hand down. I'll just go past you. But you may have to unmute yourself, Kim, if you want to ask a question. I guess not. Melissa, I'm going to go to Melissa. I'm going to. Um, Kim, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, mute you again, just so we, in case there's a dog barking in the background. And Melissa had a question. Let me find Melissa's question here. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you, Melissa? Don't go away. I'm gonna find it. I know you're in here somewhere. Mark, Mark, Melissa. Hi. Can you just tell us your favorite quick Rollins story? Melissa asks. Oh boy! I know. Uh, favorite favorite, that, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> uh, wow. We'll wait. <laughs> yeah, let me think about that. That is, um, that's amazing. Uh, okay. sure you want to get as close to your favorite within your top ten favorite stories. How's that? Yeah. One thing you have to realize is John Rollins was a serious guy. He didn't have a, a a great sense of humor, okay? And uh, 
what you'll see in the book is, uh, oh God, it's a tough one to describe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of something that's funny. <laughs> it doesn't have to be funny. She just said your favorite. It could be this horrible story. Little, <laughs> little story. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah. The there was a an article in a one of the very popular magazines of the day. It was it was it was a it was a newspaper, but it's kind of like a magazine uh, format. It was Harper's Weekly. Sure. And mm -hmm. Harper's Weekly um, ran a story about John Rollins in, I think it was 1864. And they mistakenly said that Rollins had been wounded in battle. Mm -hmm. He never had been wounded in battle. And he thought that was really funny. <laughs> really? So, uh, he didn't have much of a sense of humor. Or maybe no, he did. That's... You know? Or, or was it Mark Twain who said the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated? Yeah. That kind of yeah. a thing. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. Good deal. Um, get, tell us some other stuff about Rollins. Uh, I'm waiting for more questions to come up. It looks like you've we've covered a lot of stuff. Melissa, it must have been a good one. You, you almost stumped Al there on that one too. Uh, <laughs> and then Kim raised, if you're still with us, Kim, and you want to raise and lower your hand, I'll know that you have a question. I'll try to unmute you again too. Um, how about Grant? Uh, how about Grant and the horse's tail? Melissa says, does that, we're, oh, we're, we're going to, yeah, uh, you know, that or should I unmute, Melissa, I'm going to unmute you. Melissa, okay. yeah. I got Melissa, I'm going to yeah. unmute Melissa, because Melissa's asking some All wild right. questions here, Melissa, you want to just uh, chat with Melissa, Al here, can you want, hang on, give her a second here, we we'll see if we can, she can unmute herself, to Melissa to realize the best of the story, yeah, I, I, she is, hang on Al a second, hi Melissa, you there, yes, hi Al, how are you, Melissa, do you want to talk about the uh, the tail that got uh, taken taken off of the horse? Uh, sure. So. Or you want Rollins? me to do it? It's up to you. So wait a minute. First, okay. I gotta no, ask you, you guys. You should tell it. You, you should guys, tell it. It's a great story. You guys know each other? Yeah, Melissa guys... helped me out with the photographs for this book. Oh, no kidding. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah, good. Melissa's. Uh, a world-class photographer in her own right. Wow, that's so great. And Melissa is talking about uh, the horse that the citizens of Galena gave Rollins before the war. They gave, it was a going away gift. Mm -hmm. And at one point, uh, Rollins went to the stable one morning to see his fine horse that had a fantastic bushy tail and the tail had been chopped off and Rollins got extremely mad and swore he was going to shoot whoever had chopped off the <laughs> horse's tail and Grant then broke out into a lot of laughter and said John that was an army mule that chewed that tail off so you know, go ahead and shoot the mule. Go <laughs> shoot the to. mule. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So, so Melissa, after that, every time Grant saw Rollins's horse with this stub of a tail, he broke out into laughter. That's very funny. That's good, Melissa. We're going to get you to run the interview next month. You got some good questions. Anything else for Al? No, Al has done a preeminent job of covering Rollins. I'm a, a huge Rollins fan, and that's I actually came in contact with Al through John Marzalak. Mm -hmm. who also knew that I was a Rollins fan and uh, Al has covered his life so perfectly and exhaustedly researched it. It's the most comprehensive uh, biography of him out there. So that's all. And you and what, what, tell, me, tell me about your interest in Rollins before Al's book. What got you interested in Rollins? Well, I work at um, Civil War Times magazine, so uh, we <laughs> cover Civil War quite a bit. And um, honestly, I had read um, the Ron Chernow's book about Grant. Right. Sure, sure. And, yep. Uh, he covers Rollins quite a bit in there. And uh, once I heard who Rollins was, he's an extremely interesting character. And I yeah. really considered him to be an unsung hero of the war. I really felt like he saved Grant from 
himself in many ways wow. and um therefore was you know i i would kind of walk around the office going hey no rollins no grant no rollins no grant <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah that's a good point rollins that's really great help grant um through grant's sort of a very strong person but he has a couple of weaknesses and sure. um, you know rollins is his right hand man and helps he's he's the stuff that grant is not there perfect together so yeah. um oh that's great excellent we didn't know we had a ringer we got a ringer in the audience yeah. now, <laughs> let, me, let me mention one thing very quickly okay melissa, we're gonna wrap melissa, up yep yes melissa has a collection of it's dead letter office photographs is that right yes yes all right tell this us about those from the Civil War era. It's a magnificent collection. And I w was trying to encourage her to write that up in an article that could be used in our journal, Manuscripts. Oh yeah, that's right. I would love to do that. That's yes. great. And maybe yeah. it'd be a, a, well, manuscript, I, a Manuscript Monday topic. I would love to do that as well, yes. The Dead Letter All Office right. are a fascinating story, so. Wow, that's great. Good deal. And th that's, you know, the old line was always leave wanting more. So we're going to leave you wanting more because we're going to get <laughs> Melissa to talk a little bit about it. Let me, let me just kind of thank uh, the Board of Trustees of the Manuscript Society, who most of them are on tonight, uh, our friends from the International Society of Appraisers who came to, to join us tonight. Thanks, Darlene and Dick and Logan Adams and a few other people I'm looking for here. Certainly Pat Ficaro on here and, and Brad Cook, who has been a big part of this all, and the Manuscript Society members and some friends from this Society of American Archivists. With that, we're going to wrap it up. Um, John A. Rawlings, No Ordinary Man. Uh, Dr. Alan Ottens, you can find that book on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble online and just about anywhere. And if you get out to Galena in April, you can meet Al and you can get a signed copy right there. Al, any last minute wrap ups here? I just want to thank you, Brian, for having put this event together and thank you all to those who tuned in to this webinar. And a special thanks as well to Melissa for uh, her great question. Thank you. Good, good deal. Thank you all. Take care. Have a great night. We'll see you next month on Manuscript Monday.